Okay, everybody, as you can see, I am not here today, and we are on our last kingdom. We are doing Kingdom Animalia, which are animals. So hopefully you guys will find that this is a lot of information that you're already familiar with. So you have your new packet. So you need to get your packet out, and it needs to be on the first page, the one that says, what is an animal? Right, that's what we're going to start with first. Right, forgive my uh, moving around here. Now, if you'll notice on the page, top left-hand corner, it talks about all animals have cells with nuclei. Animals are made from many cells. Animals must find food to eat. And then it says used for getting foods and mates. In order to be an animal, these are the only four things that you have to be. Because okay? remember, in a kingdom, it's very, very, very general. There's a lot of animals shoved into this kingdom. Okay? And if you remember... Cells without a with a nucleus means that you are eukaryote. Okay. You are multicellular. You are heterotrophic. And you are modal. Okay. Now, modal means that you can move. And in the case of animals, animals all have the ability to move at some point in time in their lives. Okay. Sponges are the lowest of the low as far as animals go. Okay. They barely made an animal. The only reason we call them animals is because they fit these four things. Now, you don't think of sponges as moving, but as larvae, or when they're first born, they're larvae, like little worms, and those worms go through the water and find a place to land, and then they grow into their sponge. Now, on your sheet, you'll it's kind of cut off, but it should say, how is food obtained if an animal is sessile? You do need to know what sessile means. So somewhere on your sheet, Right, that sessile means it's attached to a surface. Okay, sponges are sessile. As larvae, they swim until they find a place they're happy, and then they'll burrow. So they'll dig into the soil or the sand underneath the ocean or maybe a piece of rotten wood, and then they stay attached for the rest of their lives. So please make sure you know that sessile means it's attached to a surface. Barnacles are sessile. Um, coral would be sessile. And these creatures all obtain nutrients by filter feeding. Somewhere they have an opening that would be like their mouth, and they basically suck water in. And as they suck that water in, they filter out the food. So they're not going to swim to catch their food, right? They're just going to get their foods through filter feeding. Now, there are so many animals in the animal kingdom that we have to somehow figure out a way to classify them. So one of the first things we're going to look at is what's called symmetry. Now, that kind of got cut off on your page, okay? but... Make sure it says symmetry. You have what's called asymmetry, radial symmetry, and bilateral symmetry. When we talk about symmetry, this is the arrangement of body structures. Okay? So, for example, we have a left side and a right side. We have a left arm, we have a right arm. We have a left ear, we have a right ear, What you would call symmetrical. In the case of asymmetry, that means no symmetry. But what that means is there's no pattern. Okay? So, as humans, all humans look the same. We have a left arm, we have a right arm. We have a left leg, we have a right leg. We have a left eye, we have a right eye. Our left side matches our right side, and we all look alike. Sponges, like I said before, are the lowest of the low. They barely make it as an animal. Well, sponges have what we call, they're asymmetrical, meaning there's no pattern to them. Or you can see this picture of a sponge here. Okay. Well, its mom might not have looked like that, or its children might not look like that. There's no pattern to their body plan. Okay? And sponges are the only animals that we put into this group. Now, the next one on your page is radial. So when you think of radial, it's like a tire, and tires are round. Okay? So things that have radial symmetry, okay, the formal definition is it can be divided evenly among many different planes. Right? Basically, you might want to note that if you, are radially, if you have radial symmetry, you are circular in shape. So I can cut you up like a pie. Okay. Hydra is probably not something you're familiar with, but Hydra is related to coral. And this guy here in this picture is a sea anemone. And I can cut it up like a pie. And so it would have equal parts. Okay, That's what we mean by radial. Or you have a jellyfish you guys have all seen. It's a circle. And so you could cut it up like pieces of a pie. And it would have a pattern to it. So jellyfish, sea anemones, coral, a starfish would fall into this category. Even though a starfish is, looks like a star, if you were to tie a string from 
leg to leg to leg to leg, it would still form a circle. Most animals in nature, including us, have what's called bilateral symmetry. The root word bi, as you guys know, means two. Lateral means sides. So with bilateral sy symmetry, the name means two sides. Okay. Formal definition, it can be divided equally only along one length. Basically, I like to say you have a left side and you have a right side. So I would cut you down your body so that you have a left side and you have a right side, and they should match. Okay. You have a left foot, you have a right foot. You have a left hand, you have a right hand. You have a left nostril, you have a right nostril. You have a left ear, you have a right ear. Okay. And so most animals that you can think of are going to fall into this category. So when animals are first discovered, one of the things we do is we look at their symmetry. What body pattern do they have? And that will help us figure out how we're going to classify it. Now, when we talk about animals, we can't use the terms front, bottom, top, or back anymore. When you're standing up, your belly is your front and your butt is your back. Your head is your top and your feet are your bottom. But if you lay on your back, now your stomach is the top. If you lay on your stomach, now your back is the top. So when we talk about animals, we can't use front, back, top, and bottom anymore. So there's certain terms that you guys need to know. Right? So the first one there, you'll, you should see anterior, posterior, dorsal, and ventral. Okay? Anterior means towards the head. Okay? So if you're standing up, your head would be up here, and your feet would be down here. Well, if you were on all fours like a dog, your head would be here, and your feet would be under you. So you can see why we have to be very specific with our terminology. Anytime you see anterior, that means towards the head. Okay? So when you're standing up, and if I were to be doing surgery and you're laying on your back and I make a cut from your belly button up to your head, that's an anterior cut. Okay. Posterior means towards your tail. Now, you don't think of yourself as having a tail, but you do have a tailbone. You're sitting on it right now. So think of it, some people say posterior is away from the head. So down here, this is the head, that's the anterior end of the fish. And over here, it's its tail, that's the posterior end of the fish. Now if you were to flip it over, anterior would be up here, posterior would be down here. That's why we can't use top bottom anymore. Okay? Cuz right now, this is the top of the fish, this is the bottom of the fish. If I were to flip the picture over, okay, its belly would be on top. Okay, so we can't use those terms. Oops, sorry about that. Likewise, we can't say back or front anymore. So the back is the dorsal side and ventral is the front or the stomach side. That's why this fin right here is called the dorsal fin because it's on its back. So like I said, if you're standing up, your stomach would be in front and your spine would be in the back. Okay? But if you're lying on your stomach, now your stomach is your bottom and your spine's your top. So just depending on your body position, these terms are going to change. So dorsal is your back and ventral is your stomach side. And what we also find in animals is this idea of cephalization. The root word cephal means head. So cephalization is a characteristic of animals where sense organs are all concentrated to one area. It basically allows your body to protect organs better. So cephal means head. So if you think about it, your sense of sight is in your head. Your sense of smell is in your head. Your sense of taste, your sense of sound, your sense of balance. All of these are in one place. Okay? And that's this idea that we call cephalization. Now, not all animals have cephalization. Oysters don't have a head. Right? Worms have a head. Insects have a head. Okay? And so when we talk about cephalization, it's basically this formation of a head. The brain or its major sense nerves are in that head. And it just gives these creatures a better chance of protecting them. So that should be the left-hand side of the What is an Animal page. So once we figure out what the creature, we look to see its body symmetry. Is it asymmetrical, radial symmetry, or bilateral symmetry? Most animals have bilateral symmetry. And most animals have a head region. We then look at what we call its body cavities. So on the left-hand side, you see, or excuse me, right-hand side, you see bilateral body cavities. 
Radial symmetry are not going to have these. Asymmetry, not going to have these. Okay. These are going to be bilateral creatures. Okay. And in all of these terms here, you'll see the root word C-O-E-L. You might want to highlight it. You might want to underline it. C-O-E-L means that these creatures have a cavity inside of them. And these cavities are needed to make room for organs. Right. Some creatures are acolomates. That means they have no body cavity. That would be like this group down here on the bottom. Okay. This is the group we call flatworms. Okay. They have very little organs. They don't have room for them. They have no body cavity. Okay. Pseudocolomates, pseudo means false. Pseudocolomates have started developing a body cavity. So they have some hollow space inside their bodies. They just don't have a lot of hollow space, so they can't have a lot of organs. An example that we often use is what we call the round worm. Colomates are most of your animals. Colomates have a body cavity. They have room for organs. Okay. This is an earthworm in this picture. We're colomates. Fish are colomates. Reptiles are colomates. Okay. So we have a body cavity, so we have room for all of our different organs. Okay. Now, if you guys think back to when we were doing evolution and I showed you the pictures of all the different embryos and you had to figure out what order they went in, like which were fish, which were chickens, which were humans, as embryos it's really hard to tell the difference between creatures. Well that's because we're all related. And what we have found from studying embryos is that we develop a certain way. Okay. So you'll see these pictures called development. Okay. After fertilization occurs, and the egg and sperm come together, you get a creature called a zygote. And a zygote is that first picture you have, just that plain round ball. And by definition, please add to this, a zygote is one cell. When the egg and sperm come together, the nucleus, the DNA has to find each other. And you're just one cell. You might be one cell for an hour, you might be one cell for three days. But as long as you're just one cell, you're a zygote. Now, the moment that cell starts to divide, we can't call it a zygote anymore. Okay. It becomes what's called a blastula. Okay. And a blastula is a hollow ball of cells. Now, what you're seeing in this picture is the outside. Okay. And so now they've cut into it so you can see the cavity on the inside. And remember, those cavities are needed to make room for organs. Okay. Now, somewhere on here, okay, there is an opening. Okay, now, remember, this is cut into, so you can't see into it. This would be like the outside. Somewhere on the outside, there's a small opening that leads down into that cavity. And in some creatures, that opening will become the mouth. And in some creatures, that opening will become the anal opening. But these cells are going to continue, you, even though this shows only one layer of cells, these cells keep growing, you keep making cells, you keep making cells, you keep making cells, until finally this ball of cells gets so heavy it caves in on itself. Okay. And when it caves in on itself, okay, where one side of the blastula folds inward, it's what we call a gastrula. Okay. Now this is what it looks like if you were to cut into it, and here it starts to cave in. So it's actually going to form a tube going through this. So imagine that this was a bowling Imagine this was a, not a bowling ball, a beach ball. You know the beach balls have a bunch of air on the inside. And if I could take a tube and drill it through the beach ball without popping it, that's what's happening here. Okay. We're forming a tube through the cell. Okay. And that tube is going to eventually form your digestive system. Okay. Your digestive system is the first thing to form. It's going to form from that tube. Now, in some creatures, this opening becomes the mouth. And if that's the case, you're what's called a protostome. And then the, the tube will continue through and form an opening over here, which will be its anal opening. In creatures like us, this opening here becomes our anal opening. And as it continues on through to the other side, our mouth will form. So we're what are called deuterostomes because our mouth forms second. Stone means mouth. Okay. Now, also, up until this point, when you're a zygote and when you're a blastula, your cells are what we call nonspecific. 
or undifferentiated. You guys know them as stem cells. These cells don't have a job. They are just dividing. They're just making more and more and more cells. Well, once you form a gastrula, at this point in time, hormones are being made, and those hormones are going to wake up the cells. And the cells are going to start figuring out what jobs they have. Okay. They're becoming specialized. They're becoming differentiated. Okay. Once the cell starts figuring out what job it's going to have, it's not called a stem cell anymore. Okay. And so what we have are these things called germ layers. Now germ layers aren't on your sheet, so please add germ layer somewhere. Okay. The term germ in science means to make or to become. So you have three germ layers that show up, and each layer will form different organs. Okay. So the outside layer, if you were to touch this ball of cells, the outside layer is called the ectoderm. And these cells will eventually become the skin and nervous tissue of an animal. Right. Now, the cells on the inside are called your endoderm. Okay. That's going to be what forms along this tube right here. Okay. And like I said, that tube becomes your digestive system. Well, remember, in you and I, we can breathe through our mouth too. Your digestive system is connected to your respiratory system. So it produces your digestive system and your respiratory system. Now, in some animals, a third layer of tissue can form. And we do have this third layer. It's called the mesoderm. It basically becomes everything else. So your muscles, your bones, your heart, your blood vessels, your kidneys, your bladder, your ovaries, your testes, your reproductive organs, all that. Okay, so it basically becomes all the other organs in your body. So that is the end of the first page. Okay, now turn in your packet to the page that says mammals. We're skipping the page on worms and insects. We're going to do that tomorrow. So turn the page that says mammals. You and I are mammals. Okay. We are animals. Okay. We fit all these characteristics. We are animals, and we're part of the group that's called mammals. Okay. Now, in the case of mammals, okay, all mammals have some kind of hair. Now, this says covered with hair. Dolphins are mammals. Dolphins have hair in their blowholes. Just like you have nose hairs, they have nose hairs. Um, whales have, some whales have baleen. These are hairs that they use to, to filter with. So even though it says covered with hair, it's more like mammals have hair. Okay. We also feed our young with milk from mammary glands. Everybody in this room has mammary glands. If you didn't, you wouldn't be a mammal. Okay. Gentlemen, you just don't make the hormones needed to turn the mammary glands on. You still have them. That's what your nipples are. You just don't have the hormones needed to turn them on. So everybody in this room has mammary glands. Okay. We're also warm-blooded. Now, what warm-blooded means is that we have a constant body temperature. So our body temperature is 98.6 degrees. If you are what's called cold-blooded, your body temperature would fluctuate with the temperature outside but within reason. Like you couldn't take a snake from the Amazon and put it in the tundra. It would freeze to death. Okay. But we're warm-blooded, and that's what we mean by endothermic. Okay. If you're endothermic, that means you basically keep your body temperature about the same all the time. Okay. Now, we do have to cool ourselves down. Okay. So one of the ways mammals keep our body temperature cool is by producing our favorite thing we talked about was sweat. Okay. Sweat release waste products. Sweat also releases heat. The water comes out of your body is hot. It allows your body to cool down. Now on the opposite side, we need to stay warm. And when we stay warm, we have a layer of fat. Okay. And as mammals, we are all terrestrial, which means we don't live in water. Well, let me take that back. Ma things like manatees, dolphins, whales, they do live in water, but they're still considered terrestrial because they have lungs. They don't have gills. Okay. And your lungs are made up of tiny little itsy bitsy bubbles. They're, it's just like having a bunch of soap bubbles. And these little bubbles are called alveoli. Well, 
just like bubbles can't blow themselves up, you have to blow the bubbles up. Your lungs have no muscles in them. Your lungs have to be blown up. And your lungs have to be deflated. Your lungs have to be pushed on for you to breathe out. And the muscle that's in charge of your breathing is your diaphragm. Okay, all mammals have a diaphragm. And mammals have a heart. Now, fish have hearts, but their hearts only have two chambers. Frogs have hearts. Their hearts only have three chambers. Okay. We have four chambers. Okay. And on there it says it has improved oxygen supply. You have two types of blood in you. You have what we call oxygenated blood, which means your blood has oxygen in it. And you have deoxygenated blood, which means your blood has carbon dioxide in it, which is a waste product. So the carbon dioxide you don't want to mix with the oxygen blood. So by having a dividing line in your heart, half your heart has blood going to your lungs to get rid of the carbon dioxide, and the other half of your heart has blood going to your body to take out all the nutrients that you need. So speaking of nutrients, oops, sorry about that. Okay. All mammals are heterotrophs. We have to eat. And you can actually tell something about the mammal based on the teeth that they have. Okay, you guys remember you have four types of teeth. You have incisors, which are your front teeth, and they're used for biting. You have canines, which are your sharp, pointed mm -hmm. vampire teeth. They're used for tearing. And then you have your molars and your premolars, which are flat, and they're used for grinding. So if you're a, an animal like a horse that all you do is eat grass, all of your teeth are going to be flat. And we're going to do an activity about with mammals' teeth later. Now that's the left-hand side of the mammals page, so we're on the right-hand side. So speaking of the teeth, okay, like we talked about these specialized teeth, I'm going to zoom in here for a second. So if you are a creature like rabbits, giraffe, deers, horses, donkeys, you're a plant eater, you're an herbivore, you're going to have a lot of flat teeth. Okay. Mammals like tigers and bears and wolves and lions look at those teeth there you guys know what they are they're carnivores and then some of us okay, humans bears monkeys this albino gorilla okay, we can eat anything so we're gonna have a bunch of different types of teeth okay. we're omnivores now, there's a lot of mammals out there, and we divide mammals up based on how they reproduce. Okay. All mammals have internal fertilization, which means you have to have um, sexual reproduction, which is sexual reproduction. You have to have intercourse for the sperm to get into the egg. Your most basic mammals still lay eggs. So this is how we know mammals are related to reptiles or birds in some way. But if you're an egg-laying mammal, we call you a monotreme. These are the most basic mammals we have. There's not a lot of them left out there. The duck-billed platypus is one of them. Okay. The duck-billed platypus is a mammal. It has hair on it. It makes milk, but it doesn't have nipples. It, the milk just kind of oozes out. It's warm-blooded, okay. but it still lays eggs. Okay. Other mammals have a pouch. And these mammals are called your marsupials. Things like kangaroos, koalas. But what's very interesting is most marsupials are found in Australia. The only marsupial found in North America is the possum. 90% of your mammals, including us, excuse me, 95, are what we call placental mammals. We give birth. All right? So this point in time, you should have two pages filled out. You should have the front page on what is an animal, and now you have the page on mammals. Uh -huh.